Hello everybody, welcome back to Fanblade. Well, we've got a project and a half here. This thing is a, uh, a Westminster branded made in Japan base from the Matsumoku factory. Um, the serial number is just there, uh, it starts with a 76, so that's, that means uh, made in 1976. It is an absolute mess. Somebody has been at this thing uh, and they've done not a very good job. Let's start at one end and uh, work our way down, shall we? Now, Westminster is just a brand name that was applied to some of these bases. Uh, they could easily have said Graco or uh, an Ibanez in some cases, um, uh, Fernandez, Fresher. There's a whole bunch of things that wound up on these. Um, this one's not been looked after. All of the chrome work is absolutely just filthy and corroded. But, and this is crucial, the tuners do turn rather smoothly. So uh, these are not the typical Japanese tuners of the era. They are Grover copies. So uh, yeah, that's a good starting point. And which is, you know, what you're going to see as we go further down. There's a lot wrong with it, but there's also a lot right with it. The neck is enormous. The neck is wider than my Rickenbacker. It is thicker than any other instrument I've ever played, just about. Um, it is uh, from uh, the back of there to the top of the fingerboard, it is 27 millimeters. Uh, Ibanez, modern Ibanez as standard, is 22. So there's five mil more wood in your hand that uh, doesn't necessarily need to be there. But that's minor issue compared with the problem of the hump in the neck. Uh, just across these few frets here, there's a, there's a, there's a warp. So, that's a major problem, <laughs> uh, but there are solutions and we'll talk about them as we go. In the meantime, we'll continue the tour down this end. It is a bolt-on neck and there is a bit of a gap on that side. Uh, I'm not sure quite how that would happen. I suspect the uh, wood has shrunk a little bit. The binding is uh, starting to crack and come off. It's in not particularly good condition, although I quite like the way it looks. I'm going to try and stabilise this with some uh, CA glue, just sort of sort of dribble a bit in there just to try and fill those cracks because uh, where the lacquer is coming off see that's just going to keep on flaking off so I'm going to stabilize the binding uh, to stop that in its tracks uh, but <laughs> again that's small beans compared with what on earth is all this I cannot for the life of me figure out why anybody would think that this was a good idea uh, I suspect they were just going on um, misguided instinct and possibly a lot of drugs uh, <laughs> it's hard to say uh, but anyway that pickup doesn't work this pickup does work um, it's extremely microphonic and given that this whole surround here is only uh, tacked in with those two screws it moves like that so you literally can't play it without uh, this whole thing just picking up massive amounts of noise. Um, it's, and even then, I mean, it's absolutely had it. It's uh, fallen off its support. I can see exposed copper on the left and right. This thing's had its day. I would not feel confident walking on stage with this. So both the pickups are going to have to go. The bridge. Wow. Now, I hate a Rickenbacker bridge as much as pretty much every single other person who's ever had to set one up. Um, but this is not the correct solution. <laughs> this is not even a solution. Half of the... I mean, I just... Like, the, the, the part of the problem here is that whoever's put this together, and this is why I think drugs may have been involved, um, where they've put the string and the screw through the... Uh, through the back plate here, they've got them round the wrong way. Uh, and now nothing is aligned. <laughs> but again, that's small beans compared with the fact that it's mounted on two brackets across the hole that's left for where the other bridge was removed. Wow! This thing is going to take some work. Um, it's going to take some parts and it's going to take some careful thought to figure out what is best for this. Because in the last video I um, intimated that I was thinking of trying to make this one fretless. Uh, yeah, well, let's talk about that. Obviously, uh, just in general, uh, taking the frets out of a base, uh, filling the slots and making it into a fretless is a pretty easy 
thing to do. This is not going to be quite so easy for the simple fact that uh, the fingerboard is lacquered so uh, and it's got a hump in it so all of that's going to have to be sanded out the whole thing's going to have to be sanded flat then we've got the issue of these giant inlays here and i don't know what they're made of and i don't know if any of my finishing products are going to stick to it evenly so pretty much we're on a hiding to nothing as far as making this fingerboard fretless goes so the question then is shall i just sand the hump out and then refret it Again, we've got the issue that it's got that it's lacquered unless I sand all of that off. So, the next hardest thing on the list would be to take this fingerboard off and replace the entire thing with one that's nice and thin. I mean, that would work really well. Uh, uh, but if I can't get it off in one piece, or if I somehow damage the other thing, then the next hardest level to the last resort basically uh, is whole new neck because it is a bolt-on. I can take the neck off. Uh, in fact one of the very first things I do before I decide which level of work I'm going to put into this uh, is to take all of this apart, set the bridge up properly, re reset the neck and see if I can even play the thing as it is uh, and then I'll have more of an idea of how to approach uh, what I need to do um, there's not a lot of tilt back at the headstock so that would mean that if I do drop the level of the fingerboard there's going to be next to no angle over the nut and that might cause issues uh, and yeah and then I've got to figure out what sort of pickups I'm going to put in it at the moment I what I'm trying to find and I haven't been able to find these yet is uh, two of the Seymour Duncan quarter pounder single coil P base pickups a couple of them in here would be a that'd be a monstrous machine uh, I cannot find one for sale in New Zealand uh, I can buy them from overseas, of course, but they take a few weeks to get here, and I don't know if I'm going to spend that money until I know whether or not I can actually even play this thing. Um, and, of course, whether or not this winds up being a fretted or fretless is going to have an uh, impact on my choice of pickups for it as well. So, uh, yeah, at the moment, anything is possible. There are lots of options. Um, and, yeah, essentially the first thing is to just pull it to pieces, clean it, and just see see if I can get it to do anything. If I, I think somebody's had a go at getting the getting into the truss rod. That screw there uh, looks to be absolutely lacerated. There's no chance that I'm going to get a screwdriver in there, so I don't know how I'm going to get in and adjust anything. I, I've got a horrible feeling this machine is going to fight me every step of the way. This was never going to be an easy project. It's not going to be a short-term project. Uh, so, yeah, may as well get on with it. things considered it's not actually a terrible bridge um, nice solid plate uh, it's kind of brass but uh, just like if it was chromed at some point then it's all flaked off I uh, the bottom of it looks like it's been machined but they haven't done a very good job of cleaning up the uh, uh, the, the machine marks on that um, yeah I don't love it but I don't hate it either it was just assembled by somebody who uh, had a rudimentary knowledge and as we all know a little knowledge is a dangerous thing as I will now demonstrate by trying to take the electronics in this one apart so this one has the uh, stereo output jack uh, I've only been able to get sound out of this pickup so when I get in there I want to actually test this thing well I actually want to pull that out and see what on earth it is because I don't recognize any of it uh, and see if there is in fact any life left in it if we can 
uh, managed to make that go. There's two screws. <laughs> two very tiny screws. Oh, three screws. Also, I've just noticed you can see where the finish has been protected from UV light by the original bridge. You know, it's sort of uh, lighter than where it's faded, but it's also lighter around here. And there's an extra little screw just there, so I hypothesize that this is not the original plate. That's interesting. That might be a clue. What have we got underneath it? Dirt. <laughs> Dirt is what we have underneath it. So that's the wire coming from that pickup. Assuming I'm just going to take that out, I'll just desolder this. And, and see if I've got any continuity across that. I've got 7.6k. There may be life in the old girl yet. I still don't want to use it. So where's the fault in this then? That means that there's a problem in the wiring somewhere. So this is a very different arrangement to what we had in the original Rickenbacker. Um, uh, in the original Rickenbacker, we had the two separate channels coming in to the stereo jack and then it was uh, uh, then just linked straight across to the mono jack which when plugged in bridged across the two channels to connect them both to mono. Uh, it appears that that's happening because there's no switch in there that's just a standard output jack. This appears to be hardwired so there's no switch being flicked but then I don't know how they're managing to not have that loop back on itself. Uh, I'm going to have to take all of that out. Uh, I'll probably just replace the whole thing, but that might be a clue as to why I'm only getting one pickup working if the other one is cutting out because it's not connecting to that channel. I yeah, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. This is something to figure out a bit later on, but it's interesting to know that that's there. So this pickup's now just held in with two screws going across the neck. and into the body. Yeah. I wonder if... That's odd. Okay, I think I know what's going on here. This, to me, looks like the base of the original pickup. Like, uh, you, we would be used to seeing this with a cover plate, with uh, maybe the toaster slots, just literally stuck on top of this unit. Probably with a grounding tag screwed in. Yes. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. So we cut out in the neck to make room for the, for the magnet. I wonder if that's standard. Yep, the finish that's on this surface is also in the gap, so that's, that's factory. So that's, that must be the standard thing, and then yeah, we're just missing the piece on the, off the top of the pickup. Okay, so this is also interesting. Uh, that's not screwed down on that side because there's actually no holes for uh, the screws to go in. So this is probably not the original um, pickup surround, which if it's not the original scratch plate, sort of makes some sense. Okay, so there's holes there. Yes, yes, those uh, those holes don't line up. Right. So we've got a replacement unit here. It's a heavy, pretty heavy base plate. Reasonably chunky magnet. Um, I was doing some research. Oh dear, yeah, you can see. You can see there is a piece of the winding. <laughs> this is not good. Um, this pickup is uh, not long for this world. I was doing some research on ancient Japanese guitar pickups and I found this picture of what this was supposed to look like.
That's how this looked in 1976. Also worth showing you is another Westminster bass that I found with uh, equally wrecked pickups. That is the result of improperly sealed forox, which is the sort of the fiberboard stuff that they make a lot of those pickup uh, uh, bobbins out of. Um, in fact, the Seymour Duncans that I'm looking at to put in this one are actually are made of the same stuff. Um, but I'm willing to bet that. Uh, Seymour Duncan seal theirs properly so they don't swell up with moisture like the way uh, the way the old Westminster ones did. And the good news is the truss rod works. The truss rod's a, a functioning thing. I've just straightened that out, so that's now a nice straight neck, except for the fact that it's got a hump in it. Looking closely at the frets, these are all nicely crowned over, whereas you start getting into this territory and they look like they've been leveled and then not crowned. So uh, that's a clue that someone has tried to correct for that hump by leveling this area of the fingerboard. I've got to find out if it worked. So uh, the next thing, now that I've sorted out the bridge, put a shim in the neck, tilt that back, should uh, hit the bridge just nicely. I'm going to put this pickup back in temporarily just to see if it works. Uh, put the old strings back on it because they're as good a test as any just to see if it plays. Because if it doesn't, then we have options. If it does, we also have options. So it's a win-win. Well, that's something you don't always see every day. I reckon back a body with no neck on it. They're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I can't say I'm a big fan of this arrangement. Um, that's you know they've got they've got some extremely short neck screws going into not very much wood, and there's a weak point cut in it there. I'm not a huge fan of that for obvious reasons. I don't see any other option, but you know, that, that is just, it is what it is, but uh, I wish it didn't have to be that way. That doesn't look too bad height-wise. There is a giant shim in there, way thicker than I would ever put in any other base. But uh, uh, these bases just don't work like other bases. Um, uh, I have identified one major issue in that uh, this bridge, now in its proper configuration, is too wide for this neck. Um, these are 20 mil string spacing. I think I need 18, because uh, eight, eight, 18. Uh, versus 20 by 3 would uh, shrink this by 6 mil, which would be quite close together, but it would uh, it would certainly mean that you're not going to do that by accident, because both of these are, yeah, they're very, very close to the edge. In fact, they are th closer to the edge here than they are here. <laughs> so that's not ideal. So uh, I will order a new bridge with adjustable uh adjustable spacing. Um, also the pickup pole pieces, even though I'm getting rid of this pickup, 
I'm not holding out much hope for it to have even volumes because those two are directly over the pole pieces. Those two are well outside the range. So, uh, yeah, uh, I guess I will uh, take it through to the studio, tune it up, see what the uh, see what the action does. It might still be very high, but then the uh, I have access to the truss rod, so I can adjust it and see if that hump is actually a problem. Because if those frets have been leveled accordingly, then it might not be a problem. In which case I can find out whether or not I like the enormous neck on the thing. I suspect I probably won't. It's a bit big. So, what have we learned? We have learned that it does play. <laughs> Despite the neck being enormous and it like it just wants to start rattling. I can just feel it just starting to go. Um, uh, we've also learned that the uh, bridge needs to be narrower and the pickups need to be wider. So, what I'm going to do is go away now and order the parts that I need to make that work properly. Uh, and being New Zealand, you know, it's going to take weeks to get here, that's just the way it is. During that time, I am going to focus on the neck. I'm going to have to take the frets out and sand the hump out. Then I've got the option to either put frets back in, or, and this was kind of the original intention of buying this thing, keep on sanding. Keep on sanding, sand through the inlays, because the fingerboard's really thick. The whole neck's really thick. If I sand all the way through the inlays, then... Uh, then I'll have a perfectly level, perfectly smooth, fretless playing surface. <laughs> uh, I'm very tempted to do that, so uh, during the next video I will be uh, working on this while I wait for the parts, and uh, yes, hopefully at the end of all of this I will have a very, very cool machine. Uh, but that is it for today. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for watching, thank you very much for hitting the subscribe button, and uh, I will see you really soon. Cheers.